experiencing a headache, so I give him a painkiller. He then asked if he could rest in my room. I said, OK, go and rest for a while. I feel this was a very normal reaction. If you have a friend in your home who is not feeling well, you would surely act in the same way by offering him a painkiller. I said, you got a phone number? I said, yeah. I said call me. So he calls up, and uh, Betty Ting Pei was the name. Answers the phone and says, I can't wake him up. And Raymond said, we'll try and wake him up, and we'll wait a little longer. So we wait about another half an hour, and more sake and beer or whatever. And, uh, he called back again, and I said, call back again. He called back again, and he said, he can't wake up. We said, well, get a goddamn envelope. On the night of July 20th, uh, I was contacted uh, quite late at night by uh, a physician who identified himself as a house officer at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, he stated that uh, someone that he thought to be Bruce Lee and who had been identified as such had been admitted to his ward and was already dead. There was evidence that he'd been dead for probably hours and uh, he was quite concerned because he had no history, nothing that could help him and he found my card on Bruce's person. Uh, and he had called me uh, at that number. Uh, he wanted to know what I had treated Bruce for, any help that I could give him, and I gave him that information. And I remember that he asked me for my advice, which is unusual for a Chinese to ask a foreigner. And I said to him that I thought there was potentially big trouble ahead, that if Bruce was already dead, there was not anything he could do to help clinically, and that he'd be, better be very careful and discreet about putting his name on anything, and that I felt that almost certainly there would be uh, a lot of attention drawn to this event and that uh, discretion uh, was very important and that he should contact someone very responsible in the administrative level of the hospital to take over from that point and urged him not to do anything to the body, uh, not to give any therapy if he was sure that he was dead and not to put his name on anything. The evening began with Bruce uh, uh, in the apartment of Be Betty Ting Pui with Raymond Zhao specifically for a kind of business meeting and rehearsal of a script. Now, there's no question in my mind that those, that was valid information. That sometime during the course of the evening, Bruce began to feel unwell and went into the bathroom in her apartment while Raymond was still present. Uh, he then actually lay down because he was feeling bad. Uh, in retrospect, I think that was a bit unwise on his part. If he was feeling that bad, he should have either gotten to a physician or he should have gone to his own home, but perhaps he was anticipating he would feel better. Sometime thereafter, Raymond left uh, the apartment to meet another business engagement, and uh, Betty eventually, when she went in to check on Bruce, found that he was not only asleep, but that he was unresponsive, and she became frightened. Now, I'm not sure how she knew how to get in touch with Raymond, uh, I don't know whether it was a, a beeper. I don't think we had cellular phones at that time. But anyhow, she was able to make contact with him. And uh, either at his advice or on her own initiative, she then called her own personal physician, who was uh, Dr. Eugene Ju. Uh, Dr. Ju uh, went to the apartment. I'm not sure whether he was told that it was Bruce Lee that he was going to see. But as I understand it, when he arrived, Bruce was already dead. Now, there have been some discussions since then about whether or not he actually tried to resuscitate, but uh, the information that I was given was that Bruce was already definitely dead. Uh, Dr. Ju uh, instructed Betty that she should get a government ambulance right away. The ambulance arrived. Uh, it was a multi-story apartment in a place where there were several buildings, and so just getting someone into an elevator and getting them down from an upper floor apartment is quite an engineering project, project. but the ambulance driver did that. He did not certify death. He took Bruce's body to Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Now, who uh, escorted the body, so I have no idea. But when he arrived at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is the largest acute hospital, or was at that time, in the British Commonwealth. He was taken into a very well-equipped, very active emergency room, and I'm sure that with his face on every billboard in town, he was recognized immediately. Uh, and uh, he was actually admitted to the floor, still with no one having certified that he was dead. Now, 
I, I was not present for these events, and I could only assess them by inference. But this says to me, here's a famous person who is about as bad as you can get. He's dead. And no one wants to have to be the responsible person to make that pronouncement. And so you just keep passing to the guy uh, down the hall because you're not going to hurt the patient by delaying, and you hope that you know, you'll be off duty and 100 miles away when they start trying to reconstruct who did what. And I've seen that syndrome so often in Hong Kong that uh, uh, I, I have to believe that that's what happened. When I saw him, he was just lying nicely in bed, well-dressed, no sign of any violence or any other struggling. So to me, when I first saw him, I thought he was asleep. Well, I had a quick look at him, look at his pupils, and found that the pupils actually were quite dilated. And when I listened to the heart, there was no heartbeat. So it's obviously that he was not alive. I tried to do some resuscitation and did some external pelvic massage, but obviously it was not going to help. So I quickly asked for the ambulance to come to take him to a public hospital. Somewhere after midnight, I received a call from Mr. Raymond Zhao. He told me what had happened. I explained to him that I'd had the call from Queen Elizabeth Hospital. He said that both he and Mrs. Lee, uh, Linda, were quite shaken, of course, and wanted to actually come and talk with me. He did not tell me exactly why, but in view of the circumstances, I certainly felt that I could not refuse that. And within just minutes, they arrived at my home. Mr. Jow was obviously quite shaken, and I could certainly see all the reasons. He was a personal friend. He was very much involved in business, and I think perhaps even a partner. And so I could see that there were great financial concerns as well as the personal loss. And, of course, Linda was really devastated. And though she was conducting herself with considerable self-control, she broke down and sobbed at several points uh, during our conversation. Uh, she wanted to know if I felt that I had enough information to tell her whether or not uh, the same thing had happened that had happened when I had treated Bruce earlier. And I told her I could only surmise that, that he was reported to be dead when he was seen on the floor at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, she wanted my reassurance uh, that something had not been left undone that could be done in terms of his earlier treatment. I was talking to uh, <clears throat> Another doctor who involved in the resuscitation team, I told him, I said, uh, I said, Dawn, yeah, his name was Dawn, I said, Dawn, I can bet you that Bruce will come back sometime. But I hope that next time we will still be here to look after him. But I'm not convinced that he's going to give up. But I said, he probably will come back. And Don ran me up. He says, Peter, what you have told me came true this morning. Bruce is dead. When they pushed his body out, it was fully covered with a white sheet. I pulled the sheet back halfway and saw him lying there with both his hands clenched into fists and rested in a cross fashion. I then pulled the sheet to look at his leg, only to see his toes were clenched together, just like someone who has suffered a fit. Also, his body was swollen all over. I suspect he must have suffered a fit before his death. I was also aware that he suffered from epilepsy when he was young. Went back to the hotel and my phone was ringing. And uh, there was a Hong Kong reporter on the phone saying, Bruce Lee's dead, what do you think? Bruce Lee's death stunned Hong Kong. As news of his demise spread around the globe, the impression he left behind could clearly be seen. Martial arts schools around the world started their classes with a moment of silence. Theater marquees posted memorials, and moviegoers held candlelight vigils. On July 24th, a public funeral was held in Hong Kong. As many as 20,000 fans swelled the funeral parlor area to catch a glimpse of Lee's coffin and the endless stream of celebrities that poured in to say their farewells. Lee's widow, Linda, and their two children, Brandon and Shannon, attended the ceremony in traditional Chinese mourning garb. 
and Linda followed the rituals of the ceremony without complaint. Unfortunately, a fantastic and controversial scandal had broken into the newspapers. Originally, Raymond Chow and Linda Lee told the press that Lee had collapsed in his home and later died at the hospital. New reports stated that Lee died at the home of sexpot actress Betty Ting Pei, with whom Lee was reportedly having an affair. What added more fuel to the fire was that the two were alone on the night Lee died. The Chinese press were having a field day. Meanwhile, fans around the world were beginning to ask questions about Lee's abrupt end. Was foul play involved? Was he truly dead? Whatever small amount of information came out of Hong Kong was quickly read, analyzed, and dissected. An official inquest was held to get a clear answer as to what happened to Lee on the night of July 20th. Forensic experts from as far afield as England were called in to show their findings based on tests carried out on Lee's body.